Welcome to Inside Economics. I'm Mark Sandy, the Chief Economist of Moody's Analytics, and I'm joined by my two trusty co-hosts, Chris Dries and uh, Marissa Di Natale. Hi, guys. Hi, hey, Mark. So what's Are going you? on this week? I'm me. I'm 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 good. I'm good. Uh, you know, I I've been on this uh, board of um of a nonprofit, a CDFI, a, a, a Community Development Financial Institution. Pretty, they're very interesting financial institutions. They marry public government subsidy with private capital to make investments in in underserved communities, inner city and and rural areas. I've been on this board, believe it or not, fifteen years. Uh, I'm I've been the lead director for five. Today, and I, I say this with a little bit of teary eyedness, was my last board meeting. So, really? Yeah. Wow. Did, they kicked what me happened? Off. You resigned they or they off. kicked you out? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, term limits. There's term we term put in oh, term there limits. Are. When I joined, okay. there was no no such thing as term limits. And uh, you know, I think it's healthy uh for there to be, you know. Uh, new ideas, new people, new perspectives. And I just turned out. So, uh, wow. but I, you know, it was uh, really a cool, uh, it's a cool organization. They do a lot of really good work, you know, uh, community centers, healthcare centers, um, education, uh, food, uh, you know, healthy food, of course, affordable housing. That's a big part of what they do right now. And uh, today was the last day, but, uh, but uh, you know, uh, well, you had a nice run. I had a nice run. I had a yeah. nice run. But anyway, I'm sure well, there's I, another one out there looking for you. So yeah, well, I right. actually joined. I joined, just joined another nonprofit. There you I, go. I feel like I, I, you know, I feel like I need to, you know, give back in some way. And I joined this uh, real another really cool uh, uh, nonprofit called the Coolidge Institute, started by a bunch of NYU professors and mostly academics. I don't know why they let me in, but they're you know all these academics. <laughs> And they're focused on data and they're focused on figuring out ways to improve government data and the dissemination of government collected data to the private sector to, you know, to facilitate what the private sector is doing. So I thought that that's, that's like, like that's right up your alley. Strikes, oh, right yeah. in the strike zone. Yeah. I, I can get, I can get down and dirty with that, you know, pretty mm -hmm. easy. So uh, I was pretty happy about that, but that was my week. Uh, how about you guys? Anything interesting going on? Marissa, you look, you look you look uh, you look good over there. I don't know what's going on. You look very healthy. I don't know what's. Oh, of course, you do too, Chris. I mean, well, I, don't I know. It's me. So, I mean, I'm like this old. Oh, you guy. too, Chris. Oh, by the way, <laughs> by the way, you, you don't, don't look, look, look sickly. sickly. Yeah, you don't look sickly. You look. You guys are in good health. Well, I, I, you know, I, I, I it make. Am I not working you guys hard enough? Is that what's going on? I just no, no. I just came back from the gym, so I I'm probably. Uh, have a post gym that glow, is perhaps. what it is that's what yeah. it is that's what it is yeah, yeah. <laughs> i think it's just the lighting yeah. the lighting's good too, yeah. too. Yeah. There you and go. also the filter that <laughs> i put on the zoom <laughs> hey guys we, we, we got a guest uh greg jensen greg welcome thanks for having me yeah greg is the co-ceo of uh, bridgewater uh, and uh, you, you know you're a little bit of an experiment greg i'm, I'm just saying yeah you know we're economists and we, we tend to talk with economists and we're, you know, this world of economics and, uh, you know, you're, 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 you are an economist. I, I was reading your bio. So you, you have economics and applied mathematics, which by the way, makes you a really good economist uh, if you've got the applied mathematics, but you're, you're a little bit different, a little odd for us. So I'm really curious to see how this conversation goes, you know, whether, uh, whether you're, you, you think this is a, a good discussion or not, but we're, we're very happy to have you. Well, great. It's a pleasure to be here. So how did you, so you've been, I was reading your bio, you've been at Bridgewater, it seems like now 25 years or so. How how did you uh, find your way there and find your way to being uh, the uh, chief investment officer, co-chief investment officer, officer of Bridgewater? Yeah, well, it's been an incredible journey. So I um, actually interned um, as a, a Dartmouth um, junior at Bridgewater in, in uh, 1995. And uh, Bridgewater was a tiny place in Wilton, Connecticut at the time. Uh, There's about 35 employees. And we managed, you know, the, I mean, there were different types of accounts, but in the hundreds of millions of dollars at the time. And, um, and I fell in love with two things, you know, that really carried me through today. One was culture of, of really trying to find out what the best answer is, wherever it came from. And so even as an intern, I had projects, I had projects working with Ray Dalio, the founder of the firm. And 
Um, and that was an amazing thing that we re- that people really dedicated to trying to figure out how the world works and, and discussing that to try to understand what's next in global financial markets and economies. And, um, and looking at the world that way, right? To try to not just have opinions, um, but to force your opinions out of your mind, translate them into rules, algorithms that you could use to predict what was next, and then you could learn. So what I've been up to at Bridgewater over those 25 years, along with many colleagues, is building out a series of understandings about how the market works, doing what we call compounding understanding, but pulling out everything that you know now a couple hundred people are thinking about what's going on in the economy and what's happening in markets, pulling out those theories, stress testing, whether you, if you use those theories across time and across countries, whether they're valuable, and then applying that. So while I'm not a fully trained economist, as, as you guys are, I'm practically trained in the sense that everything we do, we have a scoreboard on. Are we predicting what's next in growth? What's next in inflation? What's next in markets? Correctly or incorrectly? And then getting that feedback and building that into our processes. So we're always staring at what we're missing in the world because we've systemized what we think our, our um, systems trade all around the world in the most liquid markets on the basis of the understanding that we've built up. And all we do is look down at that process, think about what we we might be missing and try to add improvements to it. And that's the process of compounding understanding that's been going on at Bridgewater for many decades now. And, um, and that basically thinking about the world and what's causing what, and um, then having the discipline to systemize that with a community of people who are, who are passionate about figuring out what's going on. I think it's an, it's an amazing job. And I went from, you know, an intern to an investment associate at Bridgewater working on currencies to running research to becoming co-CIO for a while, co-CEO as well. And, um, and it's been a beautiful discovery about how the world works losing money, making money in the markets. Mm. And then, um, and also a personal discovery of strengths and weaknesses about myself. So that's, mm. that's it in a nutshell. Well, you got a tough job. It sounds like you're an economist that is accountable. That's pretty, <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty I was good. thinking that. <laughs> yeah, right. it's a, you're accountable. Uh, and Bridgewater, how can you characterize how large a firm it is now? Uh, how, how big is it? Sure. So we have about, you know, 1400 employees we're managing, um, you know, $150 billion roughly. Um, and, um, and are kind of the biggest hedge fund in the world. That wasn't how we started. We started again, the, the heart of Bridgewater is this deep understanding, which could be applied in many different ways, right? We were, when I joined, we had a very small hedge fund as part of it that started in 1991, but, um, we were a currency overlay manager and a bond manager. And over time, because we thought the best way essentially to extract all of our thinking was to have everybody in the most diversified mix of our thoughts, which was what we call pure alpha. Um, and so that's grown and pure alpha is, you know, in the about $85 billion um, in, in pure alpha. We also have defensive alpha that essentially is a product that's tuned to essentially make money to create alpha when markets do poorly. We have all weather, which is the best way we know to mix. If you don't have views in the world, what's the best essentially asset allocation to provide a balanced return stream over time? Um, and so those are the, the core things and optimal portfolio that kind of combines our views on how to how to build a portfolio with alpha that's designed to do well when, when beta does poorly. So those are the things and over, you know, very long term, um, well, with many, many mistakes along the way, um, have produced more um more winners than losers. And, and that's, that's, that's why we, thing. we do this. Yeah. Hey, can I ask, and this might be a question you don't want to answer, but uh, well, maybe the first one you will, I got two questions for you. One, what is the best call you ever made in the 25 years at Bridgewater? The one you're most proud of? <laughs> well, I think the best call personally was was joining and building this community. Oh, um, so no. On markets, but <laughs> I knew it. Let me answer your uh, <laughs> yeah. But The reason that I say it that way yeah. is, look, we don't make calls like that. You know, it's yeah. not like one, nothing. If we're doing yeah. this well, it's no one big thing, I see. right? That we're okay. systemizing these views and we have we have views on 150 big liquid markets across the world and, and any one big thing would be a problem. But I will say, you know, coming into that, because it, it plays into today, I think recently, there are many things through the years, but I think 
and I know you've thought about this a lot, that um, the big call coming into this year of recognizing that what was going on with inflation nominal GDP was much more of a demand driven thing than the markets were anticipating that it would be lengthy in its time and that the fed when i mean it's almost shocking to realize this but at the beginning of the year the terminal fed funds rate was 130 basis points um and um that that terminal rate just to define terms is the uh what the market thought the highest the rate would get going forward the federal funds rate the key rate the fed controls would get going forward right and now that's over five, right, in terms of where people expect it to get. It's, that's huge in terms of the impact, right? And recognizing that the inflation would cause the tightening and the tightening would then affect all the markets. That was a big call that we got, you know, the first six months of this year. That was the dominant thing happening. And, um, and you know, I feel good that our process, like this was not a simple thing to understand, a lot of cause effect linkages in there to understand what was actually causing the inflation, what the likelihood was. And, um, and having, you know, nailed that well, that was good. Now you come into this, we're moving into this other phase where I don't think, although it's been um, over the last three months, that the wiggles in Fed tightening are going to be the dominant influence. But, um, but having, you know, really pictured that well, recognize what that would mean for financial assets, and the fact that it would impact almost everything. Um, that was a that was a big call that we got. Let me ask you on that. Uh, of course, at this point last year, Russia's invasion of Ukraine was wasn't really on the radar screen. Maybe global oil traders were starting to sniff it out because you could see oil prices starting to move higher. But it wasn't certainly broadly in the discussion. It wasn't until Early this year, and they, of course, they didn't, Russia didn't invade Ukraine until, um, I believe, February. Uh, doesn't that play a role in the very high inflation that we observed since then? It's played some. Um, I don't think, to be clear, I think it, it can be overstated that, but it, how much that did. But I, I'll say, right, so interestingly, right, when they invade Ukraine, what happens, right? So we're prepared and already doing well up to the invasion in Ukraine for this inflationary period, et cetera. The initial market reaction to the invasion of Ukraine was a treasury rally. I mean, you think about how nuts that was. Um, but it, it tells you something about how markets react to events, right? Stocks fell, treasuries rallied on a, on a risk kind of move without the realization of, well, what does this mean? This is a furthering of these major trends, right? You had this huge impact of what we call monetary policy three, but the mixture of fiscal and Fiscal policy and monetary policy simultaneously massively hit the world in 2021, creating demand without offsetting supply, flows into 2022. Then you get this acceleration of another big trend that's going on, which is deglobalization. Okay, take Russia off the map. In a sense, that's happening with China as well. Although we could talk about that. It's a complicated question. But you've also deglobalized. You're deglobalizing supply chains. You're hitting the energy pipelines. Big deal added on top. So yes, that accelerated a problem that was big coming into 2021 and then got even bigger with the, the movement in, in Russia. And then, of course, as people start to realize the impact that has on some commodity prices, that was going on. But the thing that you're seeing in labor markets it otherwise was happening anyway. And in fact, to some extent, the, the inflation caused by the Russia slowed down some of the dynamics that were beginning to appear in January in terms of labor markets. And, um, and so that, um, that accelerated what we think would have happened anyway, in terms of a significant inflation and a significant tightening um, that, uh, that we expected going into the year. Got it. <clears throat> well, here we are today, and we got a big CPI, consumer price inflation uh, report uh, this week, this past week uh, for the month of November. And I thought I just at this point turn to maybe Marissa, Marissa, that that felt like a pretty good report uh, to me. I mean, I don't know that you could have asked for a better report. Uh, what, what did you think? Yeah, it was certainly heartening and what we want to see. I mean, this was the second month in a row where CPI inflation growth as measured by the CPI was was softer than consensus was expecting. So um, in, this was for the month of November. Overall, CPI was up a tenth of a percentage point month on month. Um, and we we were expecting 0.2. Consensus was at 0.3. So we were closer, but 
it was still soft hey, I'll that we it. were expecting. I'll take it. Yeah, That's our exactly. Crack team, D- and we were team. we yeah. were the month before too, closer than consensus, I believe. Um, so year over year on the total CPI, we're up 7.1%. And that's now come down to the slowest pace since December of 2021. Um, core inflation, so this is X food and energy, was up 0.2 month over month. And that's the slowest pace it's been since August of last year of 21. And year over year core is up 6%. Um, just some of the highlights that I see in it. I mean, energy is now clearly a drag on inflation. Prices were down 1.6% month over month. And that was pretty much across the board with with oil, motor fuel, gas, utilities, all down. Um, there okay, was- a, just, to, just to put a finer point on that. So yeah. oil prices spiked when Russia invaded. Right. Got up to 125, 130 bucks a barrel at the peak back in June. And uh, since then, the fallout here has started to fade, uh, where the world is adjusting to the disruption to Russian supplies. And of course, we got weaker demand coming out of China. It's a big uh, right. consumer of, of oil. So we got oil prices back down. And right now we're at, what, 80 bucks a barrel, south of 80 bucks a barrel, I believe. And so that that uh, swing is uh, now benefiting us in, in the form of much lower energy prices, gasoline prices in particular. That's right. Yeah. And um, a, a couple other things I wanted to point out, goods prices are now falling for the second straight month. So wow. month over month, they were down half a percentage point, uh, which was roughly in line with what they were the, the prior month. New car prices were unchanged month over month uh, and used car prices have been falling for five straight months. And those declines in used car prices are getting larger with each passing month. So in November, they were down almost 3% over the month. Um, food prices, which we've talked a lot about, they've been persistently, you know, they've been sort of one of the thorns in the side of inflation. They still rose half a percentage point over the month, but it was a slow slowdown from the previous month. Um, and it was the slowest pace since December of 21, if you look at total food. But that was to- that was completely concentrated in food at restaurants. So food at home prices, grocery prices still accelerated slightly. Um, core services, which the Fed is keyed in on, prices there slowed too, which is good. Um, they rose 0.4% month over month. It was up 0.5% in October. And there were a bunch of declines across core services, medical care, health insurance, airfare tickets, hotels, lots of different categories. It was pretty broad based. Um, and then the uh, one other thing I want to point out is housing costs, because that's been we've had a lot of discussions about that, um, both rents and OER, owners equivalent rents, they uh, they both accelerated over the month. Now, we know from private sector data that this should st- we should start to see a slowdown in shelter costs probably in the spring, because we know at least on the rental side that new lease signings um, look like they're coming in at you know slower pace of increase than they had maybe six months ago. So that was kind of the one blemish, if you will, in the report um, was shelter costs accelerating a bit, but pretty much everything else was was down or there was some disinflation there. I just point out the point two on core ex food and energy, you, you annualize, you know, multiply by 12, poor man's way of annualizing. That's pretty close to the Fed's target right there. If, if, if you, if you, I'm not arguing that we're at point two consistent going forward, but I'm just saying uh, that's uh, consistent with the Fed's inflation target, right? On CPI. Okay. Yeah, the Fed's looking at, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, Greg, just um, the, the Fed is really in, um, you know, Chair Powell said this in his remarks the other day, they're really zoned in on core services, X shelter is what they're looking at because they think that's where they can influence prices through monetary policy, that a lot of those, a lot of that demand is coming through wages. So, and that I think didn't change change if you look at if you take out uh shelter from core services greg you wanted to say something yeah well there's so much that was a great rundown but there's so much <laughs> there's a lot going, there's a there. lot. Yeah. So, yeah. so much going on i mean I, i'd say the following which is if you could turn back to somewhere around june what became evident is the monetary policy has started to have an effect on demand and on nominal demand and that um 
the CPI, it was a little quirky. You actually had some strong CPI reports for fluky reasons um, for a couple months before the last two months that you've had those weaker ones. I think there's a noise in when different things come in, whether it's the used car prices and so on and so forth, that that different data, in the insurance thing and all these things, if you get into the details, that... Um, that I do think the last two, two months probably overstated a little bit, but the ones before, like uh, overstate the decline, the ones before understated it. Big picture is inflation is decelerating uh, from a cyclical perspective. And um, that's a big, that is a big deal. And it's been interesting because I talked about something we got right. I'll, I'll tell you, I think you, you check it out and asking, give me something you got terribly wrong. But I, the, that was uh, where I was going to go <laughs> next. I thought you might not like, like that question. But the, but uh, I, yeah. yeah like so too. this impact, right? So the, what has now happened over the last couple of months, um, you know, we've gotten wrong is that we knew we, we expected inflation to roll over in a significant way, but we didn't expect the, the degree of the market reaction. And to some degree, the mix between how much is real growth and how much is the fall in inflation. But you definitely had this transition or somewhere around June where you went from a nominal economy that was booming to the tightening starting to hit hard, hit hard in housing, it hit hard in many places. But it's flowed through largely to nominal and largely through demand, uh, we think. I could describe why in a minute. Um, that, um, that So now you've got this fall in inflation and the markets are reacting to that, kind of reversing the moves in the beginning part of the year saying, okay, well, Thank gosh, real yields don't have to rise more. The Fed doesn't have to tighten more. Everything can go up, right? Which if you take the first six months, everything went down totally in line with the real yield. And now everything's kind of going up totally in line with the movement in, in the real yield or Fed tightening, whatever you measure you want to pick. What we think is missing and has been a surprise that it's this missing is the implications of the tightening today. Even if the Fed stopped tomorrow, which they're very unlikely to do, but even if they did, we think that the baked in the cake implications for demand are only beginning to show up and they're big and they're, they're coming. They're not here yet. And in that mm -hmm. way, today feels like the beginning of last year, where last year everybody's talking about inflation, but the market's not pricing it. They're pricing the Fed to go to 130 and, um, the, and they're pricing stocks to be fine. And, and so nothing's priced in despite what seemed to us anyway to be right in our face. Today, I feel somewhat the same way, which is, the implications of the degree of tightening to date, the way that's flowing through the world isn't getting priced in. So the actual movement in interest rates is flowing through day to day, but the, but the implications of those movements on the real economy aren't, which is, I think is interesting. I think it's going to be proven to be wrong, but that's kind of what we think next year will be the implications of this, the most rapid tightening we've seen since the early eighties and um, the extremity of that and the extremity of the implications of that that have been lagged for a variety of reasons. But I think that's really the, the thing we expect in 2023 is that shift towards that. And part of that will be lower cyclical inflation for sure. But and, and if you measure prices of things you can actually measure on a day-to-day -day basis, everything's deflating, rents, any real me real world measure of those things. But, um, but that doesn't mean prices for corporations, wages for, for corporations are still going up because they don't, not everybody's negotiating day-to-day, -day, even though it's true. Today's a better day to negotiate wages than six months ago for a company, but it's a lot worse than three years ago. And so wages are a trailing indicator. Like rents, they reset. They don't reset day to day, even though if you were resetting day to day, you'd see, okay, wages have cooled off a little bit. Rents have cooled off a little bit, but it's a lagging cost. And so you have companies with lagging costs and declining revenues. And probably in our view, the biggest hit to profits you've seen in a long time coming that's also not really expected. If you look at the markets, the markets are saying uh, profits are going to be okay. Like, yes, so maybe a shallow profits decline next year, but off to the races in 2024, and inflation is going to come down and no problem, which leads to the issues with secular inflation as opposed to the cyclical one that's coming down. I, I got so many questions. Mm -hmm. I, and, oh, oh, okay, uh, you're right, Chris. You need to enter into the conversation, but I'm no, just I'll, writing I'll, at the I'll, bit. Go I'll ahead, be brief. Greg, comment. Yeah, you're okay. Greg, you make a lot of sense. That's <laughs> <laughs> We've been having a running debate about a lot of what you just discussed. Uh, well, first first question, just to go one step back before we kind of move forward in the conversation, demand and supply, you know, which is, and it's demand and supply. I, I think we would all agree it's just, you know, which is more important. And that does make a difference in terms of how you, how you think about inflation and lots of other things going forward. 
How do you square the this demand side argument with the high inflation all over the planet? It's everywhere. It's not just in the U.S. In fact, in Europe, it's you know more significant than it is here. So, how do you square those two things? I think a inflation is generally global. We could talk about more interesting are the exceptions to the inflation than the fact that a lot of countries are having it. But let's go through the causes, right? So, if you go backwards, not just in the U.S., but the COVID response to the COVID recession, which is probably the worst recession, could have been the worst recession we ever had. You close everybody in their room. I mean, awful. If you hadn't had an incredible monetary and fiscal response, that's other than wartime, unprecedented in the sense of making corporate balance sheets whole, more or less, particularly for small and medium enterprises, making households, improving their balance sheets. You never have a recession where households come out with a better balance sheet than they went into the recession or corporations. So what did you do? You printed money and the government handed it out, right? Not literally together, but basically in at the same time. And so you didn't have to borrow the money. You just produce it. You kept interest rates low and gave everybody disposable income at massive scale through many programs. And that was true in the US. That was less true, but still very true in Europe. Um, and so you created this demand that at the time you couldn't even supply. Like where did the supply come from to create that demand? Well, everything shifted to goods. China cranked up. So if you said supply of goods increased at one of the, at a record rate, actually, it wasn't like supply of goods didn't crank up. China's market share went from 22% to 25%. Their exports went up 25% in a, in a course of a year. I mean, massive for the biggest exporter in the world. Goods production was crazy, but it was still not enough to keep up with the demand that had been created because people's incomes weren't hit. Normally, if all the services shut down, you would have less income to spend. Here, you got your income. And you spent it on goods and good supply surged, but goods demand surged much more. Um, so the argument on the supply side, the mistake, it's true that that led to this gap between demand and supply led to pileups at ports and all these problems that look like supply chain problems. But it's really because demand was in so much excess to supply and supply was higher during COVID than it was pre-COVID, if you look at just how many goods were produced. Um, so I think that's what people miss that. And again, anytime, and this is true of wars or whatever, if you print money and spend it without, print, without creating production, normally the money you spend comes from income, which means you're producing something and you're getting income for it. When you actually just get a check in the mail, everybody simultaneously gets a check in the mail, a different dynamic, which is super important. Another reason long-term inflation matters is governments have now come to the conclusion correctly that the easiest way out of a deflation is this, print the money, spend the money, you'll get out of a deflation. It doesn't matter how your demographics, your technology, you do that in enough size, you can cause inflation, no problem. And it's been illustrated in my view very, very clearly. So that's where the, the demand versus the supply thing um, really started. And that increase in the balance sheet so if you now take that through today, that increase in the balance sheets for households is what's allowed savings rates to continue to fall, despite the normal driver of savings rates being interest rates and um, interest rates and wealth effect. Savings rates continue to be to decline. They've declined massively, supporting growth, and they continue to be quite low um, and and falling, which I think is a stress on the system going forward because a lot of that wealth has shifted hands in terms of who's at, who has it at this point. Um, but I think that's why we see it as much more demand than supply, just going in and looking where the dollars that were used to purchase assets came from. And the global part of that is not a big surprise when you combine in currency moves, the dollar surges um, and the rest of the world's currencies collapse. So that's driving inflation in those countries. And the US is such a source of demand that global demand sucks things in. And now that then spirals, right? In the sense that it's it's falling into labor markets, it started to hit labor markets in Europe, it hit labor markets in the US, you've got those wage gains. And in Europe more so than in the US, but both, you have really important um, colas. You have things that are linked to past inflation, which create, um, you, which create spending in the future based on backward looking inflation, which is another aspect of the spiraling. So the labor market and the, essentially government payments that are tied to inflation are the things that create the ongoing nominal demand at those at those new higher levels and that's the part that you know continues to flow flow through it so so chris do you do you buy into the greg's argument here or do you have a 
would you push back on this? I mean, uh, it, this is this is not the way I would explain the, the inflation dynamics. Uh, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Occam's razor. The most straightforward explanation is the is the explanation. But but wh- wh- how would you respond to or or wh- do you buy into what he's saying? I do buy into to much of it. Um, I don't know that uh, he was discounting uh, supply effects altogether, but I, I do think there are certainly some significant supply shocks. I, I think the Ukraine war was not just a, a small one. I think it was a, a, a certainly significant reason why uh, inflation did kick up in 2022. So I don't want to, I do, I wouldn't want to discount that. Uh, but I think that certainly that the the demand story is is a significant part of it. That yeah, well, and if you take core inflation more. coming into the year before before the attack, so I, I agree, there's a supply story going on simultaneously. Although in aggregate, very interesting how elastic global demand, global supply ended up being when you look at it relative to global sure. demand. But the um, but the point that before the six month, if you annualize the six month inflation rate entering 2022, so before the um, Ukraine invasion, it was 5.8 percent already. I'd say that's supply too, though, Greg. That's the yeah, delta so they, wave of the virus, taking out supply chains and causing vehicle prices to go north and shortages, right? That, that's- yeah, and then just think about how many vehicles were bought. Like, so then look at, so I, th- this is what I would ask you to look at um, in that is, okay, was there, were there fewer cars? Sold by by a lot. What's that? The the sales of vehicles were way, uh, were way well, down. New, right? I think you're talking about new cars. New cars, because way down. New car, yeah, they, the new cars. They couldn't sell them because they couldn't supply them. There was no production because there was no chips, right? But so, the demand for the cars and such, but anyway, it goes way beyond cars, was incredibly high, right? And the chips, why did they run out of the chip production, right? They shifted around what they were producing the chips on. But um, but why did they run out of the, the chip production? The chip plants in Malaysia shut down because they had COVID. I think, that, again, if you go through it, yeah. the dollars spent were so much higher than those impacts. I'm not saying there weren't some, and there always are shutdowns of different things, and there were more during COVID than normal. But if you, again, look at the dollar spent on those things, and in aggregate, the supply produced, um, I think that's how you'll you'll get to which one it drove, and I'm not sure the other way to do it. Um, I'm not sure what's Occam's razor. I'd say to me, the more Occam's razor thing <laughs> yeah, is yeah. look at look I at all that. the dollars that were created and spent. Yeah. And where did you think they went? How would they just how would production possibly keep up, even if it was increasing at two percent, if the money available to consumers was 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 surging because money was printed and 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 um handed out in that that manner? But we also uh, had some structural oh, shift during that time as well, right? People moving away from public transportation towards card, right? So it's not just the, yeah, that's the stimulus true. money, right? It's also preferences shifting. And all of those demand. things definitely were happening and, and mattered. And, and this comes to, and a lot of things are changing, some of which deflationary, some of inflationary, but the most important thing that um, is happening on a going forward basis is that the global labor market is much less arbitrageable than it was um, over the last decade. That's be a big deal. As you go through this, when you can't arbitrage global labor nearly as much, um, and so that's part of the story of this, I'd say the secular reasons inflation is likely to average above two, significantly above two, is one is the um, deglobalization. Globalization has been a big part of what caused inflation. We we'll get into how to measure that, but a big part of what caused the low inflation rates for so long at reasonable growth rates, and um, and deglobalization of supply chains happening very quickly. And the second part of that, probably quicker than globalization happened for what it's worth. And the um, and at, on top of that, you have the policy response that what are they gonna do if you do go into low inflation and weak growth? I think we all know what the policy response is gonna be. And that's a huge change from the policy responses we've seen over the last 30, 40 years in the developed world. Well, I wanna <clears throat> advance the discussion a little bit and talk a little bit about, I, I wanna come back to the Fed, but before I do that, uh, before I forget, talk about markets a little bit. And something that's confusing me about markets, if I look at the bond market, the treasury market, and I look at the shape of the yield curve, that seems screaming, we got a problem dead ahead, the recession, right? Curve inverts, short-term rates rise above long rates. And and that that's happened to a very significant degree. Historically, and we can talk about the intuition, but you know, historically that uh, has presaged recessions uh, with a high degree of accuracy. 
Now you look at the equity market and the equity market's down, depends on the day. I don't know what it is today, but it's you know down say 20 to 25%. That doesn't feel like that screaming recession. That feels like just a, a shift in multiples re related to the run up in interest rates that, you know, and it's a lot of it's tech stocks that were all juiced and now they've come back down to earth. It doesn't feel like the market's discounting you know, bad times ahead with big declines in, in earnings. Uh, if that were the case, we'd be down, I don't know, 30, 35%, which I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's kind of the average or median kind of peak to trough decline in equity prices, you know, going into recessions. F first, two questions. One, did I characterize things correctly? And two, if I did, how do you, how do you explain that? I, what, what do you think, what, what, what's your thinking around that? Yeah. Well, I think to re like a, I think the market's, in our view, are making some of the biggest pricing mistakes that that we've ever seen oh, under pressure. So, okay. so I sort of agree with what you're saying. I don't think those things are reconcilable. But if you did reconcile them, I think I you see. basically we're trying to reconcile them. What you have to think is, you get this very rapid decline in inflation, you get a very moderate recession, and you get a very rapid easing. Right? That's the that's the record. The kind of perfect Goldilocks minor recession caused by this. Fed reacts to it super quickly. And um, and we move on to better times, and that you get strong growth from there. That's the that's the only way I think the all that market pricing could be right. And it's possible. It's possible. It's I don't think it's highly likely, but that's basically what the markets are saying. And um, and to us, that looks really wrong. I think there's a series mm -hmm. of things that are wrong about it. That a like you're saying, I think the earnings recession is much deeper than that. I think the Fed is going to be very slow unless you get a very clear signal. The Fed is going to be slow. They, they generally are when inflation's high or coming off high inflation. They're gonna, it's going to take a lot of evidence, way past it's actually true, for the Fed to believe that they've got the inflation thing whipped. So unless there's major growth downturn, they're not easing quickly. They're going to they're going to play this out. And why even ease if the economy is not weakening much? So I think those are that picture is pretty unlikely um, and creating some some great opportunities. And you've got all kinds of differences all around the world as policy decisions are quite different and 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 big balance payments changes and all, all these things. So it sets up this incredible macro landscape, I think. Um, but anyway, the main reconciliation would be this great drop in inflation without growth getting hit very much and profits being okay. Um, that would be the the best you could say for reconciling that. But you're saying more, most likely the equity market's just mispriced and it, that means we're going to see some declines in equity prices. Yeah, so well, are. yeah, and I'm bear we're bearish on both bearish. equity and treasuries. So bearish on equities because we do think the profit thing is going to be hard and equity on, and on nominal bonds because that price in easing is probably optimistic. Again, mm. as you come back, I do think cyclical inflation is coming down. But what's been so interesting in this period is no secular inflation. There's no worry about secular inflation, break-even inflation rates like the nominal bond yield. Why is it at three and a half? You have to believe no problem for inflation in the long run. It's only a short run problem. Mm. The market believes that with such um, confidence that it's pricing in lower inflation now, long-term than it was at the beginning of the year. Interesting. Um, and I think mostly mistaken in the sense that yes, it's, it's right in the short term that cyclical inflation is coming down here. But the um, but probably wrong given the structural, and so you can see this environment where inflation comes down a bit, but not as much as you would think for the cyclical conditions. Cyclical conditions deteriorate not terribly because you also have the benefit of not having a financial cascade, um, in the sense that probably, I mean, when you, the financial system has improved a lot since two thousand eight, you don't have as much of the riskiest things going on on leverage as you did, although you have some of that, um. But it's still relative to the history of of the world. That's our high. Um, so not it's not 2008, but that's our high. In a lot of the rest of the world, there's a lot of short term debt um, that's getting repriced. There's a lot of areas where you'll see you'll probably see things popping, and um, but likely one thing after another. And growth is weak, but not horribly weak. So we're, we're thinking the U.S. is like down two next year and. Europe's down three, roughly around those areas. Two two um, two percent real GDP. Real GDP decline. Two percent. Wow. Yeah. That is that is bearish. Yeah. Um, interesting. Yeah, and what's interesting about that is, you know, that look, maybe we're wrong. Maybe, but if you take this level of tightening, you take the the starting point of the savings rate, and you and you know what's like what's happening in the housing market, et cetera. The I mean, these are the worst conditions. 
that you've had. So of course you could say, well, recessions are rare. Why, why would you be confident? Well, so are tightenings of the magnitude that we just went through. So are the, the sets of conditions globally that are going on are remarkable, you know, like, and that, um, that the fact, I think most people are getting confidence out of it not happening yet. Um, I'm probably in our view, overconfident. It does matter. The momentum in the economy matters, but, but, um, but when you look at the causes, what's sticking and what's what, where the weakness is coming, this is how it works, right? Interest rates rise. You start to see it in the interest rate, important sectors. That's hitting as hard as it ever has. You start seeing the bubbles at the extreme collapse, and then that keeps moving towards the center, right? So if you take the crypto collapse and the tech, the high or the tech, all the losses that those entities, all that money that was getting burnt in those en- money burning engines. Were, were somebody else's profits. That money was flowing into compute. That was money was flowing into the core S&P 500 companies because they spent all that money that got spent, got spent somewhere. So when you look at the, the history of how these things, the tightening happens, you had a extreme tightening. The, the next thing that happens is interest rate sectors and bubbles collapse. And the third thing that happens is that that then starts to impact everything else. And every, every cycle has this lag time and the only reason that we mistake the, the lag time is you think, okay, well, stocks have been going down for a while, but for, like you said, it's only because real yields went up. Actually, expected profits haven't even begun to decline yet. And, um, and so that chain of events is classic. We're following that classic domino. And, um, and so I think that's likely. Now, the argument on the other side is that- well, nom- Can I say, I, I, I make the argument on the other side. <laughs> That's, I'm like, it's so interesting to me because uh, I, I think about the bond market and the equity market and I ask you how to, to, to square it. And you say, well, the equity market's wrong and we're going to see a sell off. And I do the exact opposite of you. I say the bond market is wrong. And, then, and here's all the reasons why the yield curve is biased or not, you know, not telling us, uh, you know, exactly what it has uh, historically. So uh, very interesting, di- different perspectives. I'm going to throw one other market at Well, I would just say they're both, I think they're both wrong for what, <laughs> for, for what oh, is, for what well, is right. Mean, I think the, the bond market is- you, You'll curve, you, you, that seems to be consistent with your two- Yeah, you know, with the, yeah. except that I think the Fed's going to have a harder time easing yeah. than is priced into that mm-hmm. curve. Certainly, I think the both can't happen. So I would agree with you. The being bearish on both has the better, like I do, I can imagine a world where growth does hang in there and the, that whole thing, and you end up with higher- Nominal yields going from three and a half to five or something in a normal yield curve, in which case stocks are probably going to fall too. Um, meaning that the discount rate effect of bonds normalizing to a normal yield <laughs> curve and the Fed not tightening, you'd have to have a really great profit situation to offset that. So I think there's a possibility bonds go three and a half to five if for the reasons you're saying, which is okay, we're wrong about the growth and it keeps coming along and the Fed doesn't go anywhere and they go to five and they stay there um, and you get a more normal yield curve priced in, or you have the other scenario where the growth is quite weak, the earnings come, now the Fed starts easing, but that's already priced in. It got to ease just to stay on track for bonds. Let me throw one other market at you and get in, in this, trying to use it as a way to interpret what the what investors are thinking about where the economy is headed. And that's the corporate bond market. So if you look at the, the difference, the spread between interest rates on corporate bonds, uh, take uh, junk corporate bonds, low, the bonds issued by uh, companies that are kind of on the financial edge, uh, have a lot of leverage and where investors are nervous about not, they might not get paid in a timely way on on that bond. Those spreads, those differences are, are, are nothing unusual there. I mean, the average, every, if you go back and take a look at the difference between a, a yield on a high yield corporate bonds and US, 10-year US treasuries, back to the late 90s when the high yield market was put on the planet the average i think you have to exclude the gfc because things just gap you know blew out then but just take that out it's 500 basis points you know five percentage point difference that's high yield corporate bonds you give you five percent more five percentage points more than 10-year treasury yield that's average there's no indication of any inkling of any kind of concern from the corporate debt market so that would be more consistent with the equity market saying, hey, you know, I'm not worried about a recession here. Is that interpretation correct or do I have that wrong or how do you interpret it? Yeah, I'd agree with you. I think the that um, and it's an even bigger problem, I'd say, in Europe, but but the um, 
But I agree with you that those spreads look narrow relative to the volatility of what's next. And and with as many things moving, like corporates are slightly different in, than equities in the sense that it's a lot about pricing the tail, how much of a tail, how many things are going to be in the tail. Because you don't get the upside, you only get essentially the downside. And uh, it's interesting, right, with the amount of volatility caused by this very rapid tightening, whatever you think of inflation, the prices of many things are moving simultaneously. There's a lot of volatility for costs and revenues for corporations that would generally lead to a very big tail. And it's not being priced in um, to a significant degree. And I think that's another uh, another likely mispricing. Oh, cool. Okay. So you're expecting spreads, the difference to gap out here at some point when equity prices, when, when, all, when investors realize, oh, we're going into recession, earnings are going to get crushed, uh, businesses' cash flow is going to get hurt, they're not going to be able to make their debt payments, at least in a timely way. Uh, we're going to see uh, equity yields, uh, equity prices go down and the spread in the corporate bond market go up. Yeah, I think so. Of, yeah. of course, a lot in the US, what happened, which is interesting and, and protects the corporates a little bit is that they termed out the debt. It's very long term for corporate debt mm -hmm. in the in the things you're looking at, the publicly traded corporate bonds. Mm -hmm. So there's a much bigger problem in private credit, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. where private credit is much more short term, like often off the short rate. Um, and the prices are not as evident of mm -hmm. what's happening there. Would you call, but, can I say that? Can I just interject just to make sure I understand? Is, is that the same terminology as saying leveraged loans, the leveraged loan market is yes. the same as private credit? Okay, fine. Okay. Well, I, yeah. So, I mean, leverage loans is a big yeah. part of that yeah. market, but um, but that I think is at more risk, although it's less transparent. So it's a little less obvious mm -hmm. what's going on. So I'm not sure, but I think there because but but what has happened in the in the corp, traded corporate bond market is generally the terms are big, which helps them from a rollover risk perspective. There's not as much debt rolling at the worst possible time. Mm -hmm. Now that's not going to help if you have negative profits and such, but it takes more. Like the worst case in the the things that really come burning at you is when you have to refinance and there's no capital available. It's not that kind of downturn. It's not where you get no financing available and that even good credits get strained. But I do think you're going to see a much bigger pile of bad credits than you get in most normal downturns, given the volatility of everything that's going on and then the movement in rates. Do you think uh, uh, that it's a potential systemic risk? I mean, something that you know, it's just not going to hurt the investors in these loans and securities, but it starts to hurt uh, investors to such a degree that it, that it affects the provision of credit more broadly and thus the economy more significantly. Is it is it a systemic risk, or is this just you know, just a problem for that particular market? Yeah, I think I think we have this slow systemic risk building, but not, again, it's not as pointed because most of those things aren't held nearly on as much leverage. The, the true systemic risks are when assets are held on leverage and now you've got to sell them and, and you get this downward cycle, right? You've got a lot of money still, if you take private credit funds, et cetera, they, can, they have draws on a lot of capital that they're, that they're able to buy things if they get significantly mispriced. So I do think you have this more gradual problem that actually makes the whole thing play out more slowly. So we're used to these very rapid recessions, very rapid declines. I think this is a more gradual, um, but therefore slower for the Fed to react. And the bottoms in these cycles, I mean, maybe this will be different, but you've never had a bottom in the equity market when the Fed hadn't started cutting rates, like um, you don't get bottoms in to tightenings and um, and not just like slowing from 75 to 50, or which everybody's getting super ecstatic about, but actually turning around and easing. Um, and usually the bottom in the equity markets, you know, six to nine months after they turn around and ease. So if you if you took the usual, like when does that make the bottom in the equity market or the bottom in, and the bottom of the economy follows that, right? So if you if you did a kind of typical you say, okay, I think the Fed might start cutting rates six months from now. Might, um, the, probably the fastest you could see it, but let's say, unless there's a stock crash before then, six months from now. And then the um, the easing starts six months from now. And typically the bottom of the equity market's nine months from there. That's 15 months out from now. And the economy is typically three to six months after that. So that's 21 months or so from now. I think it's likely even to be longer than that. That's a long gradual recession, all a function of the fact that rates have been rising Assets have been falling and the Fed's not close to easing. Normally, they'd be easing by now. 
mm-hmm. given what's happening in the financial markets. And if inflation wasn't so high, they certainly wouldn't be tightening. And so having this tightening that's still going on into that, that leads to this long recession, which back to the credit thing just means this longer period of economic downturn for that grinds out companies rather than it being a financial credit problem. It's an economic credit problem. Got it. Got it. Uh, let me ask one uh, factual question. I think it's factual. So you have a you're down two percent GDP, real GDP next year. What's the funds terminal funds rate in that worldview and that kind of expectation? Is it five percent or is it, because that's where the market is right now around five percent? We're we're at four and a half, I think, uh, four and a quarter to four and a half, and I think markets are pricing four and three quarters to five, probably closer to five. Yeah. Are you are you there? Are you higher than that? Where are you? Yeah, we think that's about right. I mean, about what's going to happen, right? And then there's the timing thing, right? I think largely it's going to happen because the Fed, based on their past errors, is going to wait for clear evidence. And um, I think that's going to lead them. They have a couple more tightenings because I think the evidence is going to be slowly. It's not like we're going to get whacked one day and it's going to be crystal clear. Um, So somewhere in there, right? So if you take the very short end of the yield curve, we're basically neutral on that. We're bearish on the long end. Um, because the market's pricing in this huge decline in rates. And we're, um, so even though we see that weak growth, we think the tightening is going to be slower than that. Plus, you don't want to, it's, it's a matter of diversifying the positions. If you're wrong about growth, what's the, the likely outcome is that that bond pricing is, is really wrong. Got it. Hey, let's play the game, the statistics game. Um, and the game, uh, I know some listeners out there are getting annoyed at me for repeating this every single week, but just for those that are new, and we have lots of new listeners as well, we each put forward a statistic. Uh, the rest of the group tries to figure that out through clues and questioning, deductive reasoning. The best statistic is one that um, is not so easy that you know we all get it very quickly, not so, not so difficult that you know no one gets it ever. Uh, and you get extra credit if it's uh, apropos to the discussion at hand. So- uh, Marissa, I'm going to go to you first. Uh, what's your statistic? Minus 0.6% in November. Is it in the CPI report? No. Hmm. They say uh, import prices. No. Ooh. Yeah. Wow. That would have been, man, he, if he got, if they got that right <laughs> off the bat. Oh, yeah. I probably would time. never go to that yeah. release. Whoa. <laughs> uh, is it, is it? A, I think it's it? also true though. I think I might also. It, it, right. may, yeah, it probably, yeah, probably <laughs> is. Typical. Yeah, probably <laughs> true. Typical. Yeah. Um, is it a, a, from a release this week? Yes. Okay. Uh, retail sales. No. Not industrial production. It is in that release. Okay. Uh, see how I do this, Greg? I just narrow it down. Just names down. every release. <laughs> Why that, that's top line industrial production. It's not. No. Oh, it's, not. it's not top line. Manufacturing. It's manufacturing. Uh, yep. Okay. It's manufacturing industrial production. So, yeah. uh, utilities, which is another component of this, was was way up. So total industrial production was down minus point two, but manufacturing was down minus 0.6, which is the first decline in five months, pretty large, um, coming from durable and non-durable goods. And motor vehicle production was down 2.8% over the month, which is quite large. And I picked but, this because it kind of- month to month, right? I yeah, it, yeah. Yeah. That's month yeah. to month. That's yeah. true. Yeah. And, and manufacturing IP year over year is still up a bit. It's, it's still up about one and a quarter percent, but I picked it because we were talking about CPI and goods prices are now falling. Um, It's squares with a lot of the other data on the manufacturing sector, all the regional manufacturing surveys, the ISM are showing weakening in the manufacturing sector. And it's just sort of this emblematic of the demand for goods falling off and being replaced by services now. Well, I think manufacturing, we can say, is in recession, probably, right? Because the ISM purchasing manager surveys below that so-called 50. 50. And now industrial production seems to be slumping. Uh, We haven't seen job declines, though, yet in manufacturing, have we? No, they're still adding to payrolls, I believe. Right. I meant meant to look at that. No, I don't think we've seen declines yet, but yeah, we'll see. It's coming. We'll see when the data gets benchmarked hey, too. Uh, while I have you, and uh, this reminds me, uh, can you explain the uh, impact of severance, these the so-called severance packages that 
people in the tech industry that are getting laid off or in financial. We're, we're seeing certainly anecdotal announcements, mm. lots of them from the tech sector, from financial services, and of course, mortgage finance, uh, blue collar, I mean, excuse me, white collar kind of jobs in corporate headquarters. Uh, and these folks get generally severance packages for at least three months, maybe as long as six months. If you're getting a severance uh, pack package, are, will you show up as in as you you where do you does that affect the employment numbers or the unemployment insurance numbers at all? Do you know? So so it's it, yeah, I, yeah. I, I think I know I know I know you know I, I'm, I'm leading you I know you know so. yeah I probably wouldn't ask it wouldn't be an interesting podcast before. if you ask me and I don't know um <laughs> uh yeah so when you look at the payroll survey the current employment statistics survey the count of jobs on employers payrolls the the trigger there is just who is on the payroll who is getting paid so if you are getting a severance package which you know in financial services wall street firms which have even today announcing more layoffs is typical to get for six months maybe even longer you're on the payroll you'll show up as employed from the employer's perspective so so because where i think where you were going with that is jobless claims are still incredibly low. I mean, they fell again this week, right? They're down to like 211,000. Yeah. That was going to be my other statistic if somebody took the IP one. Oh, damn, so, I wish you had picked that one. I would have gotten that right away. Because, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, so we don't see it yet, right? We're not seeing these all these announced layoffs showing up in the unemployment insurance claims. And if you're getting severance, you're not going to file for unemployment insurance. In fact, I'm not sure if you even can file for for ui if you're getting a uh, severance pay um so it could be that there are more job losses out there and they just haven't shown up in the statistics yet because of the severance yeah i think that's to greg's point right that it's coming the yeah weakness. yeah and a lot Chris, of things in the labor market are interesting because of how slow it's going to be in lag right you a you just went through yeah. the shortage of labor that yep. slows things down you've got on top of that the shift from um the shift of services from manufacturing, which is super labor intensive, like a labor intensive <clears throat> shift, even at the same growth rate. And third, you've got, I think this like more politically conscious um, mm. firms that are going to be wary. They're certainly like, how do you square buybacks with laying people off or whatever things that were more normal in past US recessions, you got, it's a little bit of a Europeanification of the recession in the sense that one of the things that created then real negatives in US downturns were the very, very fast rate of firing, but that also created the faster rebounds. And if Europe, the rate of firing for a bunch of regulatory reasons is much slower and um, and, the and the recessions as a result go longer. And you take this from the Fed perspective, they're looking square at employment and employment is going to lag, mm -hmm. is going slow. It's the wages are, are going slow. And so if you're looking at that, understandably, you're looking, staring at that kind of missing what's happening, which is probably also going to lead to a much worse profit drawdown than economic drawdown. And um, and some of that makes sense. We've had the opposite for so long where profits and corporations have done better than the economy. The refinancialization where labor does better in the downturn than corporates could be a, a kind of rebalancing of what's been going on for the last 30 or 40 years. But um, but that's, um, and that's part of deglobalization causes that as well, that um, that's how I think it'll play out that the layouts layoffs are coming later for a variety of reasons than they have in a typical U S downturn. That's interesting. That's very interesting. Uh, Hey, you want to do another one? Uh, uh, Chris, you want to give us your statistic? <clears throat> uh, sure. Well, first let me say, Greg, you can come back anytime. I'm <laughs> <laughs> arguing all my points here. So 44.6 uh, is the number. 44.6. Is it a, is it a regional ISM survey? Uh, how can he delay on that one? No. <laughs> Either it is <laughs> or it is. Like it. <laughs> is it the NFIB survey? Yeah. No. National Federation. It's not the small business survey. Okay. 41.6. 44.6. Oh, 44.6. Oh, big difference. Yeah. And big so big. it's not one of the regional. It's not a regional it's not Fed. It's the Fed. It's not a Fed. Oh, it's regional. 
It's not regional. <laughs> well, it's, it applies to a region of the world. This is so confusing. <laughs> it so it confusing. applies to a region of the world. And this, I think he's misdirecting us. He's like throwing oh, up smoke. Oh, it over it. So easy a... that I wanted to. You know, oh, I see. Throwing a little, a little dust, a little sandstorm. Uh, and is it from a release this week? It uh, from a release today. Oh, what came out this today? morning? No, oh, is uh, regional employment and unemployment came out? No, today? no, no. Well, nothing else came out. The today. region is the U.S. That's just to be clear. <laughs> oh, uh, I don't know. Do you, any other hints you want to give us? Uh, that came out today. Uh, I didn't think anything came out today. Uh, is it home builders or something like that? No. Uh, you S&P. can't give us a. How about S and P? S and P. Not the house price index. No. K. Schiller. No. S and P. S and P is a competitor of Moody's. <laughs> Are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, this is, they're they're bad. This is they're bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't. I, I I'm I'm at a loss. It is it's probably really pretty straightforward. Uh, S and P is, is a stock is it related to the stock market in some way, Chris. No. Um, bond market. Uh. Oh, we can't hear you. You're on uh, mute. Yeah, I don't know how that happened. U.S. Composite Purchase Managers Index. Oh, oh, you know what? I, oh, that's why because I I don't follow. That. You don't follow that. Yeah, one. I don't follow that. Uh, so what is what did it say? Is that for manufacturers? So that's the uh, that's the total. That's oh. and then they have a split by for manufacturers and services. Okay. So forty four point six is the aggregate. Yeah. It's down two points from November. Anything okay. below fifty indicates contraction so clearly slowing and then both the services and the manufacturing components were down right services oh. at services at, at 44.4 and manufacturers is at uh, 46.2 so there's so contraction is, across the board so this is much more a pessimistic uh, view uh, compared to the uh, ism the purchase the uh, purchasing manager surveys that we typically look at which Manufacturing just fell below the fifty threshold, and service companies are well above fifty. Right? They're right. Actually, quite so strong. Is... How do you that? They're just, I guess, measuring different things somehow. But they're two very yeah. different perspectives. I mean, one of the interesting things, right? And this comes in the NFIB or whatever, is that these surveys, a lot of them, are getting screwed up by views yeah. on inflation too. Like yeah. if things are good yeah. or bad, it's a growth view and an inflation view, not good just point. not just a growth view. And, um, and so we've had to, like in our processes, recognize that and recognize what indicators that we would normally find reliable are actually less reliable unless you can split out what, what the person is really answering. Are they answering about the general macroeconomic environment, which has an inflation component, and a growth component, um, and things that in normal inflation periods will look a lot like growth actually end up looking different. So that, I don't, I don't know that point. that's going yeah. on here, but. It's certainly been an issue with surveys. Yeah, so you're right. In... So I, the I think the interesting part, sorry, actually in the in the details, sorry. right? They talk about uh, declines in new business, new declines in uh, exports, declines in business confidence, right? So understanding those components, but some improvement in uh, input prices, right? So commodity prices are down. So businesses are benefiting, yeah, from from that standpoint, but uh, they're seeing they're pessimistic when it comes to new orders, employment. Uh, they at least the manufacturers in this survey indicated were basically flat, right? They're they're not replacing people who quit, um, but they're not actively laying off in large numbers. Yeah. So. Well, I guess the other thing about these surveys, they're sentiment driven. It's, it's, it's kind of a quasi sentiment survey as well, because it's qualitative as opposed to quantitative, or there are parts of it that are quantitative, but parts of it that are qualitative. So if people are feeling they're not feeling good. That will be reflected in a, kind of a weaker kind of ISM number. But that to square S the S and P number with the ISM numbers, I'm not sure how to square those two things. Hey, we're running out of time. Um, did we want to do one more? Or I have, I've got uh, another question. For I'll give Greg you one we... real quick. Here okay, go ahead. All right. Here. Yeah. Uh, but uh, this will be a little bit impossible. But, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, <laughs> oh no! Because it's it's a year to date number. But the okay. but for the year to date number is four point one percent. Four point one percent. Year to date, is it related um, to inflation prices? <laughs> no, it's it's a um, 
because it's it's a, a little bit of a construction. You're, you're not going to get it, so I'll just tell you. But it, it comes back to this. Oh, thing, he's, he's is, taking pity on us. You see? Yeah. yeah. Hey, oh, <laughs> man. Not even give he us. Want, a he wants to post out our misery immediately. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, it's ahead. the S and P 500 through yesterday adjusted for discount rates. So it's up uh, if you adjust uh, for the discount rate. And essentially what the long-term outlook for profits have done, um, stocks are up 4.1%, which is interesting if you, um, yeah. you know, anyway, there's a lot of assumptions you have to put in to, to do that. But by and large, the picture's right, which is stocks are not down. If you think of them as a return stream of future earnings, they're only down because the discount rate is up and they're actually, if anything, the profit, ex the profit expectations implied in the price have gone up this year, which is that's really cool. Everything we're talking about. Yeah, that's really cool. That's really cool. And we would not hey. have gotten that. No, I, I, I would not no have way. gotten that. No, I, I, my mind immediately to go to the year to date S and P, but that's got to be down. Yeah, the year to date down 20, is almost 22. down twenty, right? And so it's yeah. up four on that basis. Is yeah. just an interesting thing when you think about what it all means. Yeah. yeah. Hey, uh, I want to end the conversation this way, and I'm not sure it's fair, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and do it. So your view of the world is very different than mine uh not as not as different as uh, chris's worldview or marissa's uh, you know I, I, I it's gonna be a struggle next year under any scenario but i think we have a, a fighting chance to avoid recession with a little bit of luck and some tough policy making so we're, we're on kind of different uh, uh with pretty different views uh what would have to happen greg for you to change your mind uh to think oh no, we're not going into recession. You know, we're going to be able to make our way through without one. Is there, and it's yeah. probably unfair. If you asked me that question, I probably, I don't know how to answer that, but I, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and ask you that question. See how you, how you, uh, how you parry that. Well, I think it's a critical question, right? Like what's so great about what we do. I mean, it's also really hard about what we do is you're, you're either right or you learn something. Um, so those are the two options and both that. can be really good. Right? Can I have a so, job, Greg? Can I have a job? That <laughs> sounds like a real fun job. Yeah. So, so, um, so look, you know how he didn't I, answer, he didn't answer me. You notice that guys? He he's like, getting there. He's getting no, there. No, okay, I'm, go I'm ahead. building up here. Yeah, okay, okay, I think we, if we're wrong, what I think we'll have learned, you know? And, um, and so I, a lot of it hinges on the thing you're saying, which is, okay, is it possible that, in, the inflation went up largely for supply reasons. Inflation comes down largely for supply reasons. This isn't a demand effect to the interest rates that the economy is actually not that vulnerable to this tightening, right? That it would be super interesting. It's possible um, that for some reason, structurally, the economy is less sensitive to interest rates than it's been over all of history. Um, but that's what I feel like we'd have to learn, right? Which is actually, it doesn't matter. You take real rates from negative up to one and a half, you know, to one and a half percent. You take nominal rates from zero to five, people don't shift into cash. The savings rates don't rise. So to me, the things that you, you know, would surprise me that I'll be monitoring is savings rates don't end up rising. Hmm. Um, and that the inflation comes down without a large shrinking in, in demand. Um, those would be the, those are the flags we're looking at. And certainly your side, Mark, um, the markets, the, like your side got more powerful over the last seven weeks, the inflation stats consistent mm -hmm. with that. And the, um, the way the markets have reacted to that this week, a little bit the opposite way, but, mm -hmm. but the last seven or eight weeks. And I think that'd be, uh, super interesting, you know, mm -hmm. if really that we learned that that degree of tightening. Um, the market reaction to that, the wealth effect, the cracking of the bubbles, all doesn't um, end up in a recession. I mean, that would be fascinating, I think. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting world that we've got something really wrong. And that's what we do. We then go stare at those things and then rebuild our processes to say, okay, well, why would that be? Why is it so different than all through history when those things happen? Um, and um, and so that's what I'll, you know, we'll be looking out for and constantly looking out for. And we certainly like to make money in markets, you get humbled all the time. So if you can't change your mind, I don't think you can you know, stick around in markets very long oh, because yeah. man, we're wrong all the time. So I said things somewhat probably more authoritatively than I, I mean them because we're always wrong. Um, and really, if you can't survive being wrong, you, you can't survive. I'm with you. That was a great answer and a great conversation. And, and I totally agree with you. Uh, uh, your last point about you got to be humble. Um, you know, goodness knows economists like me have been wrong about many things over the years, but uh, it was wonderful to have you on. Really enjoyed it. 
And I'd love to get you back just to tell you I told you so. Uh, just- <laughs> <laughs> All right, let, let's let's schedule that. I think we'll know a lot if we if we you have to this, wait twenty four months though. No, nah, if we do this this time next year, I think I'll be surprised if we don't, okay, yeah, if we don't that, have a view of uh, which one of us was was right. I, I agree with you. The moment of truth is at hand. I think on this this particular issue. But thank you so much, Greg and. Thank you, dear listener, for uh, listening to us, and we'll talk to you next week. Take care now.